Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For fear of uh, time getting away from us, we'll commence our final panel for AusCert 2014, the now customary AusCert speed debate. For those of you not familiar with speed debating, great concept. Nine very intelligent know-it-alls from across the conference debating six different topics, each individual speech in each debate only one minute each. An absolute avalanche of opinion, some of it even informed opinion, coming your way very quickly. You'll be voting using your devices in the same way that you've been providing feedback and evaluation on the session so far. You're completely familiar with that by now, I know. Our speakers get one minute each. I'll introduce you who they are, then run you through the topics for this afternoon. First up, Peter Gutman. Peter returns to the Ossert Speed Debate after a self-imposed year in exile, a researcher in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Auckland. Peter helped write the popular PGP encryption package, which I must say is one of my very favourite encryption packages. In his much-lauded white paper, Cost Analysis of Window Vista Content Protection, he described the content protection specification as, quote, the longest suicide note in history. I like this guy. Give Peter Gutman a round of applause. Dan Klein is another return speed debater, a man of many talents, not just a security expert working for, amongst others, Google. He's also a professional photographer, singer, writer and improvisational comedian. This will come in handy when I ask him to perform at least one of his speeches today as an improvised song. Give Daniel Klein a big round of applause. Best of luck with that, Daniel. Now, in introducing our third debater, uh, I was slightly surprised last night when I was told it was the 13th Auscert. Not as some of you might be thinking, wow, has it really been 13 years? But I was thinking, am I surprised that I've only seen Scott McIntyre drink 13 cocktails? For those of you not in on the joke, Scott is the longest serving member of our speed debating panel, happily returns year after year to deliver his fast paced, often hilarious critiques on just one condition that he's provided with a cocktail of his choice to consume during the session. This year, Scott has decided to shake things up a bit and give us a list of potential cocktails and asked us to surprise him. So welcome to the stage, accompanied by two ounces of tequila, four lime wedges, five cucumber slices, one dash of hot sauce, vigorously shaked for 10 seconds and served in a rot glass with a salted rim, otherwise known as an El Guapo. Scott McIntyre, <laughs> loving his El Guapo there. Time to welcome a newbie to the speed debating circuit, Vice President and Principal Analyst at San Francisco-based Constellation Research. Stephen Wilson leads their work in digital privacy and cybersecurity. He's also an absolute machine on Twitter as Steve underscore Lockstep. Judging from his output over the last couple of days, he's probably tweeting my intro to him as we speak. There you go. Yes, he is. He holds nine PKI patents, so he clearly knows what he's talking about. Stephen Wilson, ladies and gentlemen. Our next speaker is the Distinguished Professor of Law for the United States Naval Academy Centre for Cybersecurity Studies, a career military officer and attorney. He has over 20 years of experience within the Department of Defence, including operational attorney for the US Army Cyber Command and working for the Department of Homeland Security and the American Emergency Computer Response Team. Rumour has it that the character played by Tom Cruise in the movie A Few Good Men is actually based on him. Now, when I asked him if this rumour was true, he simply said the truth. You, sir, can't handle the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Clark. Oh, there's more where that came from. Our next panellist has entertained us before at the Ossert Speed Debates and, like Robert Clark, boasts military experience. Marcus Sachs is Verizon's Vice President for National Security Policy and a member of the CSIS Commission on Cybersecurity for the Obama Presidency. He's testified before the US Congress, has a 20-year distinguished military career in the Army, including serving one of the 10 original members of the Defence Department's Joint Task Force for Computer Network Defence. He refuses to comment as to whether the role played by Jack Nicholson in the film A Few Good Men is based upon his life at the front line. Please welcome Marcus Sachs, ladies and gentlemen. Now, unfortunately, one of our original panellists, David Litchfield, had to pull out of the session to make a connecting flight, and so Claire was hit with a mini crisis this morning. Claire, I said, I need it short notice. I need an uber geek, really smart, confident public speaker, happy to argue anything, may well not believe or even understand what he's saying at any point in time. Adam said, Claire, I've got just the geek for you. Please welcome all cert security analyst and renegade speed debating gun for hire. He is really actually helping us out of a big bind here. Marco Ostini, good on you, Mark. Thanks for coming along. I bumped into our next speaker before dinner last night, and he was telling me about his family. And as my six-year-old ran around the room terrorising people, he reflected on his eldest daughter, who had just turned down the chance to study computer science at Princeton because 
Her dad is a professor in the department that she would have been studying at, and it would have just got a bit weird. So clearly, in the Felton family, the fruit does not fall far from the hyper-intelligent geeky tree. He's the founding director of Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy in a career that has seen him named by Scientific American magazine as one of 50 worldwide science and technology leaders. He's shown a particular interest in the science of online elections. So, oh, the irony that you hold in your hands the digital devices that will determine the fate of one of the world's experts on computerised voting. Please give Ed Felton a big round of applause. And our final panellist is an information security journalist who's written for the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, Bulletin Magazine, securityfocus.com, wide.com, ZDNet and others. Best known as the host of the Risky Business podcast on risky.biz. Now, initially, I was not sure if the character played by Tom Cruise in the film Risky Business was based on Patrick. But at about three o'clock this morning, in a nightclub on Broad Beach, he stripped down to his underpants and sang old time rock and roll. Now I know it was not based on him. He promises <laughs> to keep his pants on if you vote for him. Patrick Gray, come on up, Patrick. Now, those of you who haven't seen this before, it'll become apparent very quickly what happens. I announce a topic and the people will be debating. They get one minute each to run you through their thoughts. You then have 10 seconds to vote for the affirmative or the negative. Our first topic, that Snowden is a hero. The affirmative, Scott McIntyre, Ed Felton and Patrick Gray. The negative, Peter Goodman, Daniel Klein and Marcus Sachs. That Snowden is a hero to kick us off, powered by El Guapo. Take it away, Scott McIntyre. Things are already getting rather blurry. Um, I don't know how this is going to go, but in my personal opinion, of course he's a hero. Think of the answers to questions that we now have that we didn't have just a short time ago. Those of us who have been working in this industry have had these questions for a while. Some of us have had some inv inside information telling us that indeed these cases might be true. But without a doubt, what he has done for the security debate, for the security discussion, has changed the world from the way it used to be a short time ago. We really needed this reality check. We were becoming very complacent as an industry. We had all of these solutions, these technologies, these ways of solving problems that now, it turns out, were rather pointless. So in my personal opinion, what he has done is turned us and turned the entire incident into a form of a speed camera. We are now much more aware of what's happening online. We are more careful. We're making more informed decisions. And to me, I would buy him a drink just like this in a heartbeat. There you go. That's Scott McIntyre leading off the affirmative. Give him a round of applause. To argue against the topic that Snowden is a hero, take it away, Peter Goodman. Of course Snowden isn't a hero. Look at, the, look at what he's done. His irresponsible revelations have caused a waste of hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars. As I pointed out in my talk yesterday, $250 million. With the NSA's help, the TSA has caught literally, well, no terrorists. But imagine how many less they would have caught if, if um, <laughs> the NSA hadn't been there to help them. The loss to intelligence sources is irreparable. Social networking, for example, thanks to the NSA, we were able to find out what Emma told Sarah that her BFF Amber overheard Megan tell Emily about Zoe. Now we no longer have access to these vital secrets. Foreign heads of state, we're no longer able to find out when Angela Merkel was about to call her hairdresser to just ask him to change pudding bowls so she can do a new hairstyle. Now we have to read about it in Der Spiegel like everyone else. All of this was caused by one single guy, so Snowden is not a hero, he's a plonker. Thank you very much, Peter Goodman. Ed Felton, take it away, arguing that Snowden is a hero. Well, I'm not sure how to rebut that, so let me just agree with most of it. Um, look, uh, this is a pretty simple question. And the question is, what would it take to make someone a hero? A hero is someone who acted at great personal risk and whose actions benefited the public. And by that standard, Snowden qualifies easily. Now, the other side may argue that Snowden broke the law, that he broke his promises, that he caused some harm. Fine, that doesn't matter. That's not the proposition that we're debating here. Uh, in fact, if you think about it, the United States was founded by people who broke the law and broke their promises to the British crown. And we consider them heroes because they did it. Yes, those people caused some harm too. They started a war that killed many people. And yet, they're our greatest heroes as Americans. And all around the world, the, uh, the heroes are the people who caused trouble, the people who made noise, the people who saw something and said something. Snowden acted at great personal risk to benefit the public, therefore he's a hero. Okay, now Ed, you, you used a definition there and you actually analysed the topic. That's getting very close to debating. That's your first warning, Ed. Okay. <laughs> Apart from that, I quite liked it. Daniel Klein, take it away, arguing against the topic that Snowden is a hero. Well, like Ed, I also went and binged the definition of hero, and I found out that it's courage, bravery, or self-sacrifice in the face of adversity or weakness. 
okay, you might be a hero, but then there's also anti-hero, where people revile the person for exactly the same reasons. And what I would say is, he's neither. He's a patriot. Just like the people at the NSA who he exposed were patriots. Unfortunately, everybody in this entire situation believes that they are doing the right thing, and the oath that Snowden allegedly broke was to preserve and defend the Constitution. I think he's done exactly that, so he's neither hero nor anti-hero, he's just being patriotic. There's not much more I can say about it, even though I've got 18 seconds left. Thank you very much, Dan Klein. To close the argument for the affirmative, Snowden is a hero, Patrick Gray. Yeah, I mean, you'll often hear people say, oh, Snowden could have escalated this internally, he could have told people. Uh, but if that was true, there were so many people who could have said something that didn't, and therefore his actions were actually necessary. One US court has already found that the metadata collection program in the United States was unconstitutional. It'll probably go to appeal, but there you go. Now, Ed mentioned great personal sacrifice. This is a guy who worked in a cushy job for a defense contractor in Hawaii, probably pulling down like, you know, a decent six-figure salary. He had a pole dancing acrobat girlfriend. The guy was living pretty good, right? Now where is he? He's in Russia, location unknown, being shuffled around by FSB guys, freezing his nuts off, and having to get on Russian TV and throw Dorothy Dixes at Putin. Talk about, you know, great personal cost. The guy is obviously a hero. Look at all the wonderful things we know. Thank you very much. Yeah. There you go. Thank you very much, Patrick Gray. Closing the case there for the affirmative. To wrap it up for the negative, Marcus Sachs. He is absolutely not a hero, not by any means, gentlemen. In fact, if he would have stayed at home and talked to us, I think he would have been held a little higher up. But I'll tell you why he's really not a hero. Look at all the things he had access to. Look at all the things he could have revealed. He goes off and reveals this pansy stuff, this surveillance, anybody can do it. He didn't tell us about the aliens. What really happened in 1948, folks? He didn't tell us who killed JFK. I mean, we all want to know what really, really happened there on the grassy knoll. And finally, where he really blew it, where's that holy grail? Where's the Ark of the Covenant? Is it really hiding in the mountains of West Virginia? These are the secrets we want to know. That's why he's not a hero. Thank you very much, Marcus Sachs. There you go. You've got about 15 seconds now to lodge your vote for the affirmative on the, or the negative. Same app you've been using to provide your feedback during the course of the conference. Tell you what, how much would Jack Nichols, and I mean Marcus Sachs, like to get Edward Snowden alone in a room for a couple of hours, yeah? You could make him answer some questions, couldn't you? Okay. Is he a hero or an anti-hero, a patron, an antipatriot? Do we really need to know what Zoe told Emma? Lock in those votes. Now, and the result, the vote for our first panel is 71% uh, vote yes, Snowden is a hero, 29% vote no, he is not. Congratulations to the yes team on that first topic. That's Scott McIntyre, Elf Felton, and Patrick Gray. Pick up the first debate. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Next topic, topic number two, Windows XP. The zombie apocalypse will be 20 years of hell. Windows XP, the zombie apocalypse will be 20 years of hell. The affirmative team, Robert Clark, Marcus Sachs and Patrick Gray. The negative team, Stephen Wilson, Marco Ostini and Peter Goodman. Take it away, Robert Clark. As a, uh, a government counsel, uh, the opinions expressed here are that of Robert Clark alone and in no way should be construed of those of the associated in any way, shape, or form with the U.S. government, the Five Eyes, or any entities or subsidies associated with institutions, governments, or political parties. Similarly, none of his opinion, opinions are the responsibility of ACERT. They've specifically claimed no liability for any comments, remarks, or bodily sounds emanating from said speaker. The speaker's not liable for any damages caused by his remarks, including damages resulting from laughing so hard, peeing in one's pants, or splitting a gut. The speakers are not liable for any damages associated with said pee in such pants or dry cleaning expenses, nor medical expenses associated with splitting said gut. If you should find this very boring and, and in no way uh, entertaining, those damages should be filed with either Patrick Gray or Marjorie Sachs, and previous lawsuits say that damages are held at about one or two beers. See them after the show. I, I will uh, concede the rest of my time on this technical subject to my technical expert, Mark Sachs. Thank you, Robert. Jeez. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel like a zombie after that. There's going to be 20 years of hell to pay because of XP. Absolutely. Probably more than 20 years. In fact, when software is abandoned, is that no different than somebody out there abandoning their house or abandoning a car or abandoning a child? Society does something when things are abandoned. But what happens when Microsoft abandons the world's most popular operating system? 
We've got to do something. Zombies will attack. They're wired to attack. They have XP on the brain. It's not going to be just 20 years. This could be 50 or 100 years or more. And I don't care what the lawyers say. Your life is in danger. The zombies are coming. Okay, thank you very much. Now, a couple of bits of feedback there. First of all, Robert, I thought I spoke fast. Um, secondly, I like the way that you then handballed over to the second speaker on your team. So you've had two speeches in a row on the affirmative now. I'd normally criticise that, but you do work for the Department of Homeland Security, so anything you want to do is absolutely fine as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Let's let someone from the negative have a go now. How about Stephen Wilson, if he'd like to point the case against Windows XP, the zombie right, apocalypse, so will be 20 years of hell. Protocol breach. I, I, I want to remind us that Bill Gates said that um, we, as humans, we uh, overestimate what can be done in one year, we underestimate what can be done in 10 years. So 20 years is beyond human reckoning. I mean, 20 years ago, we could not have imagined the world with Facebook. Uh, 2034, I hope, that we'll come full circle and we will still be able to imagine a world without Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, singularity? Uh, 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 there's such a confusion. I mean, I'm sorry to get technical about stuff, but um, technical uh, it is. Singularity seems to me to be one of those metaphors looking for a futurist. Uh, people um, think that it's the point where consciousness merges with machines. I mean, that was when the Hawkwind albums first got onto the iTunes store. Um, Singularity is where, where the laws of physics break down. And it's not XP, it's go to fail where the laws of physics have already broken down. Thank you very much, Stephen Wilson. There you go. Marcus, you strictly had about 15 seconds left. Do you have anything else you want to add? Or was your continuation of Robert's first speech your actual speech? Oh, mine was actually in support of it. That go-to fail Apple bunch of crap. <laughs> Microsoft is just totally dominating the planet. Apple has always been in catch-up mode. So Apple continues to fail. That's okay. It's the apocalypse, folks. The zombies are going to get you. They are wired for Windows. There you go. Marcus Osterney, what would you like to say in negation of the topic? Okay, well... The thing is, XP's been around a while. A lot of people still use it, 30% of people uh, at February this year. And uh, a colleague of mine mentioned recently that uh, his, purchase a new, or his uh, organization that he works for purchased a brand new MRI machine that has a great capacity to do a lot of good. Um, it went through all the proper compliance processes through the uh, FDA. And so when it did finally arrive, uh, it's running XP. And so will a lot of other uh, med medical equipment that we'll have in our hospitals. Um, Virgin Airlines, they're still running XP on their check-in um, uh, stations, and I'm sure lots of other airlines are as well. So if these guys are running equipment in a fashion that's already compliant, how can it possibly be a problem? Where's the apocalypse going to come from? They're compliant. So no, no apocalypse, surely. There you go. Thank you very much, Marco Ostini. <clears throat> Patrick Gray, you're effectively the fourth speaker on the affirmative, but it's your job to wrap it up. Yeah, I like that. Compliance will save us. That's uh, it's pretty good. Uh, XP isn't going anywhere. It's like the IT equivalent of herpes. It's it's just <laughs> there is no cure for XP. Take a look around. You know, I mean, do people think we're putting ATMs on private networks? Hell no. That's expensive. This stuff is out there. It's not going anywhere. It's baked into everything. I agree with Marcus. We're looking at 20 years of hell. Go plug in. A network interface, just clean onto the internet and see how many code red probes you get. You know, talk about ghosts of machines past. It's going to be the same thing with XP, just systems getting hosed everywhere, chaos, it's going to rain fire, headless horsemen, the whole thing. It's all over. Forget about it. it we're done. It's over. I'm sorry. Uh, we should all just turn the lights out on the way out. <laughs> Cats and dogs meeting in the streets. It's going to be an apocalypse. It's a lovely, lovely, upbeat way to finish your speech there, Patrick. Thank you very much. Peter Goodman, your chance to wrap up this debate. What do you think? So this claim, yeah, XP will be 20 years of hell. Nonsense. To see why, let's look at who's running XP. China, the Asian persistent threat. Romania. Uh, Nigeria. Government departments. XP will be 20 years of hell, but it'll be their hell, not ours. <laughs> Other organisations, Inland Revenue, we're sorry, but we can't suck any taxes out of you this year. We're too busy patching some O-Day on XP. Um, yes, we know you were caught doing 2,000 kilometres an hour in a 30 zone, and as soon as we figure out why our Windows XP machines keep rebooting, we'll get round to fining you. It's brilliant. XP will be their hell, not ours. There you go. Thank you very much, Peter Goodman. There's your second topic, Windows XP. The zombie apocalypse will be 20 years of hell. You've got 10 seconds to vote yes or no on that one. 
Do you agree with Patrick Gray that XP is the IT version of herpes or not? It's looking very close on the monitor I'm looking at. You've got five seconds to get your votes in there as I wrap it up now. Oh, and it was literally sitting on 50% each and the yeses poked their nose across the line on the siren. Congratulations, Robert Clark, Marcus Sachs and Patrick Gray for picking up that debate by the narrowest margin I think we've ever had in an all-cert speed debate as we move to... As, as we move... Oh, and it's just popped back to 15. As we move to topic number three, the NSA and friends are systematically undermining security standards, so we'll never be safe. The NSA and friends are systematically undermining security standards, so we'll never be safe. Stephen Wilson will affirm with Ed and Marco Ostini Patrick Gray will negate with Mark Sachs and Scott McIntyre to lead off that the NSA and friends are systematically undermining security standards so we'll never be safe. Take it away, Stephen Wilson. NSA systematically undermining security and standards. Ladies and gentlemen, it is self-evidently true. NSA is a cancer on the security of society. It is destroying the fabric of the family. I refer, of course, to no strings attached dating. NSA dating is uh, clearly no threat to the uh, security of AUSERT. In researching for this topic, I found that 50% of NSA sites are actually blocked by the, uh, the porn filter that we enjoy. And so I sleep well at night knowing that NSA is not getting anywhere near me here on the Gold Coast. The very idea of NSA dating, that is to say, spending a tawdry few hours thrashing about in the dark just for fun, with no accountability and no consequences, it makes me sick. It's immoral. It sounds like software development. <laughs> More work of the devil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen Wilson. They're leading off to our topic number three. Yeah, give him a round of applause. As I said, we, ha we had a first in the history of Ossert Speed debating just a few seconds ago with our closest ever results. So get those votes in nice and quick. I've just had another first. Uh, during the course of Stephen's speech there, Patrick leaned over, tapped me on the elbow and said, can you remind me which side am I speaking on in this? <laughs> Patrick is speaking on the negative right now, if that's all right. So <laughs> leading with his very heartfelt beliefs on the topic. Take it away, Patrick Gray. Yeah, I mean, you listen to the opposition here and it's all like 9-11 killed JFK, man. Wake up, sheeple, right? So they reckon the NSA is this big, scary organisation reaching into absolutely everything. What people seem to be forgetting is that the NSA is a government department, OK? <laughs> You look here in Australia, the ABC has the equivalent funding of all of our intelligence agencies put together. Do you reckon the ABC could like do anything that terrifying? But no, we're all scared of ASIO, not of auntie. So I don't know, man, it's like, it's really nice to believe in these conspiracies and that they've got plants in open source projects. But the fact is, they're just not that organized. You know, they couldn't, they probably couldn't organize a piss up in a brewery. So a lot of this stuff, eh, it's overblown. But hey, we're about to hear more about the, you know, grand conspiracy, whatever. <laughs> I'm happy we've been slipping under the radar at the ABC. Actually, when we look through the round window on Play School, we're looking directly <laughs> into your house, Patrick. But anyway, <laughs> take it away for the affirmative, Ed Felton. All right, Adam accused me of using logic last time. I'm going to try that again. How many, how many people here have read a security standard or tried to? Hands up, please. Was it good? Who liked it? No, security standards are terrible. And simple logic dictates that there are only two possibilities. Either it's us, the security community, who are messing things up, either we're too incompetent, distracted, and in some cases drunk to get these standards right, or somebody is undermining them. That somebody is the NSA. It's very simple. There could be no one else. The NSA is undermining our standards. Left to our own devices, we would do a beautiful job ourselves. Sadly, that's not the case. Thank you very much, Ed Felton. To rebut the topic, Marcus Sachs, all yours, Marcus. Well, first, before I go, I want to thank Ossert. This is not water. Thank you. <laughs> and the first clue was a fly landed on top of it. It was a very thirsty fly, and I had to shoo him away. Anyway, you know, it's very rare when I agree with Patrick, but doggone it, we are not being undermined. We can trust the NSA. They're not going to do anything goofy to us. And even if they were doing something goofy to us, our enemies are scared to death of those folks. So it's probably a good thing for them to put up this false front that says we're out there manipulating all this software, and we're installing all these back doors, because it scares the crap out of our adversaries. And what do they do? They go off and invent their own 
own little crypto algorithms that nobody's bothered to check. You ever heard of like the uh, content encryption systems for the old CDs? It was kind of a homebrew encryption. We want our adversaries doing that. We want them believing that the NSA is subverting everything. So they go off and develop things that we can crack. Last thing before you vote, go online and look up, spell the word Illuminati backwards. Dot com. I'll just spell it for you, I-T-A-N-I-M-U-L-L-I dot com, and convince yourself that the NSA is not undermining security standards. Okay, thank you very much, Marcus Sachs. Illuminati backwards dot com. Take it away, Marco Ostini. So, um, I think I find myself agreeing very uh, wholeheartedly with my colleagues. That, um, Probably a good thing, Marco. <laughs> that the NSA can be very bad. I mean, think of the families that the no strings attached dating group has, you know, led to. The NSA is in no strings attached dating. It just, it's bad for individuals. It's bad for families. It's bad for married couples. Think of all the unwanted pregnancies. Think of all the damage the NSA has done, you know, and I agree, you know, with all the thrashing that's sort of akin to software development, you know, that's sweaty and smells bad. I mean, the, the, the no-strings-attached dating has a lot to answer for, and it will undermine society. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, filters may help a bit, but ultimately people just have to say no. Say no to NSA, say no to no-strings-attached dating, because it's just not good for you. Thank you very much, Marco. As I pointed out, Marco did come to this whole thing quite late, but I lo I'm loving where he's going with it. Scott McIntyre, your chance to wrap this debate up for the negative. Thank you very much, Marco. So I'm going to start off by saying, no, you're wrong. And I think that we're focusing on the wrong part of the problem here, because the second half of the statement is, so we'll never be safe. And that's the part that we need to be able to fix. So you've got half the equation here, you've got half of it right, but we can actually do rather a lot. As Ed Felton referred to himself earlier this week, we have created an atmosphere of pervasive insecurity. And I think that we have an opportunity now to fix that, to correct that, to move forward. We can be safe again. We can, unlike the Abbott government, invest heavily in education and ensure that people moving forward understand security, understand cryptography, and apply solutions that actually make the world a better place. We can be safe. We don't have to be the, well, the sheeple, as we referred to earlier. We can move forward. And when you're talking about no strings attached dating, it does seem rather connected with the previous question and the XP herpes. Is there something you want to share with the class? There you go. The next Prime Minister of Australia, Scott McIntyre. Thank you very much, Scott. <laughs> NSFW coming up. You've got 15 seconds to get your votes in. Don't muck around here, because we, we, we've got a monitor here. We can, we can see the progressive voting, and it's bouncing around all over the place. I, I did what you suggested, Mark, because I put the it, itanimalu, itanimali, uh, dot com into the... Uh, yeah, and it goes to the NSA. Yeah, that goes straight to the NSA.gov website. Nice work. OK, that's a great party trick that only works at certain parties. But anyway, <laughs> five seconds to shut down that vote again. Four, three, two, one... Done on the topic, the NSA and friends are systematically undermining security standards and will never be safe. The negative of one by 61% to 39. Congratulations, Scott McIntyre, Marcus Sachs, and Patrick Gray. Well done there, guys. Okay. Topic number four. Your grandchildren will trade in cryptocurrencies. National currencies will be history. The affirmative team will be Marcus Sachs, Peter Goodman and Scott McIntyre. The negative, Marco Ostini, Robert Clark and Dan Klein. Your children will trade in cryptocurrencies. National currencies will be history. Take it away, Marcus Sachs. Absolutely, they'll be trading in cryptocurrencies. Of course, Bitcoin is the one everybody's familiar with. That's just the first start. That's like bags of wheat back in the Egyptian days. We're going to grow to something else. Currencies like the US dollar, the euro, others... They're all fading away. Those are industrial age currencies. Mankind moves through technology and moves through currencies like everything else. So absolutely we're going to be trading in online crypto type of currencies. You know, if it doesn't work out back at home in Washington where I live, just keep this in mind next time you're in Washington. The Lincoln Monument, everybody's seen the Lincoln Memorial. It is solid gold. It's just painted white so that it looks like a memorial. If those Bitcoin things fail, it doesn't matter. We have this big gold thing. We can just melt it down, build all our coins, and we're off and running. But you know what? To tie all this back to the beginning, the reason this is true, it's because Windows XP will always be here. There's your crypto. It's always in place. You can't get rid of it. Get used to it, folks. It's here to stay. Thank you very much, Marcus Sachs. Well said, sir. 
Marco Ostini, the microphone is yours, negating that your grandchildren will trade in cryptocurrencies. Harking back to my previous reference to no strings attached dating, I mean, how are you going to be able to know where your children are, let alone know what your grandchildren are up to? I mean, they're all over the place. It's, you know, until you start getting paternity cases and tracking DNA, golly, who knows what they're trading in. But slightly more seriously, slightly, um, pretty much every empire that ever existed anywhere in the world, the Romans, um, the Byzantinians, Chinese empires, etc. Any, any place that ever had a currency, that currency was backed up by a regime that gave it authority. Um, it was very interesting to see with Bitcoin that uh, people were beforehand, before the big crash, said, Crip, um, you know, Bitcoin will get rid of uh, uh, regular currency, it'll take over the world, um, it, we don't need governments. And as soon as they had a massive fall, they're going, why doesn't the government protect my Bitcoin? No, uh, Bitcoin, uh, and other cryptocurrencies won't last because there isn't anyone with authority backing it up. Thank you very much, Marco Ostini. Where is the Reserve E-Bank? He's asking. Peter Goodman, you're on the affirmative this one. National currencies will be history. Of course they will. Bitcoin will prevail. Imagine you've got a currency based on a sound mixture of cryptography, anarchy, anonymity, libertarianism, wasting huge amounts of electricity and the enduring value of tulip bulbs instead of some bizarre stuff like Keynesian economic theory. When the US dollar finally collapses and takes civilization out with it, then in the non-XP zombie apocalypse that follows, we know that we can rely on the ready availability of the internet, electricity, and lots of high-speed computing power to run our currency. And in any case, who wouldn't want to be paid in a currency that's worth $60? No, $480. No, $1.50. No, $1,000. Lotto has proven such a smash hit. Now you get to play it every day with your paycheck. Gamified wages. It's clearly the currency of the future. Thank you very much, Peter. But gee, wouldn't it be a tragedy if we lost that New Zealand dollar? What a big kicker in the world economy that is. Okay, Robert Clark, on the negative, if that's all right. Take it away, Robert. Uh, being uh, the only lawyer on a panel, um, I'm not really concerned about what your currency is, because I'm going to take a third of it, no matter what it is. <laughs> um, and, and then the other problem of being a lawyer um, and dealing in numbers, uh, the old standard is, if you ask Peter down at the end there what one plus one is, he does this weird crypto thing on it and everything, and uh, hashing, and I don't understand that. But if you ask a lawyer what one plus one is, we always say, what do you want it to be? So from, from that aspect, um, I would like to just highlight one aspect of national currencies. If it weren't for national currencies, I wouldn't be an alcoholic today. I grew up in the United States that had a stronger dollar than Canada, and Canada had a lower drinking age than the United States. Where do you think I went? With my pittance that I made caddying so I could get more alcohol. So I would just like to thank the national currency systems for making me what I am today. Thank a you lawyer and an alcoholic. There you go. From the heart. A mea culpa on the topic of alcoholics. Scott McIntyre, you're going to uh, close it up for the affirmative team, if that's all right. Uh, 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 no, sorry, I would actually like to thank you for making my point for me, because one of the most powerful things about electronic currencies, cryptocurrencies, is that they are borderless. So you actually have proven the point. You cross borders to get what you wanted. And when we're looking at the future and we're talking about online trade and being able to drive commerce around the world without having to deal with these stupid, rather um, temporary borders, especially in Eastern Europe at the moment, um, you have a, a situation where you have a potential ahead of you for being able to buy anything you want at any time. And the point also goes back to grandchildren. If you go back and take a look at the news of the last week or so, Coinbase is giving $10 worth of Bitcoins to university students who can prove they're in university right now. Those are somebody's grandkids today. Now, we are already starting it. We are seeing in popular culture, television shows like The Good Wife are talking about Bitcoin being in society now. We have a lot of problems with the current implementation, but the idea is sound, and in a few generations, we're all gonna be paid in, in some form of electronic currency. Of course, I'm not a breeder, so it's not my problem. Thank you very much, Scott McIntyre, well done. <laughs> to close the debate for the negative, Dan Klein, all yours. Well, I find myself agreeing with my opponent, Mark Sachs, in that currencies evolve, but I don't think they're going to evolve into triple rot 13 uh, cryptocurrencies. <laughs> I also disagree a little bit with my colleague, David, who says that currencies have a regime backing them up. Currencies have trust backing them up. When you have gold, we believe that it is scarce, we have it in our hands. Then we have currencies that are based on gold, and we believe that the gold is there. When gold no longer becomes the basis of our currency, we lose trust, we eventually get hyperinflation, and cryptocurrencies come into play, and that's just going to be terrible. 
So I think that my grandchildren are going to be trading an endangered species. There are so many of them, you can adopt an endangered species. The bilby, the palm cockatoos, the hairy-nosed wombats. There are only 124 of them left. If you can get two of them and they breed once, you have a 50% return on investment. I believe that endangered species are going to be the currency of the future. And with that, we can save the planet at the same time. Everybody wins. There you go. Thank you very much, Dan Klein. See, Scott McIntyre's appearing today just from El Guapo. Dan Klein asked for two baby harp seals, and now I understand why. <laughs> Tough crowd. Let's move on. Okay, topic number four. Time for you to vote now. You've got another 10 seconds. Your grandchildren will trade in cryptocurrencies. National currencies will be history. You've got five more seconds to get those votes in. I'm going to wrap it up now, and it's a quite convincing win to the negative there. 62% of the vote to 38%, so congratulations to Dan Klein, Robert Clark, and Marco Astini. Well, Astini, well done, Marco and team. Give them a round of applause. We move to our second last topic. We have to face facts. No amount of today's conventional security will protect assets worth billions of dollars. Now, that's a quote we lifted from the Constellation website. It's actually attributed to one of our panellists, Stephen Wilson. So I can't wait to hear the uh, debate today by our speed debaters. For the affirmative, Robert Clark, Daniel Klein and Marco Ostini. For the negative, Ed Felton, Peter Goodman and refuting his own quote, that should be great, <laughs> Stephen Wilson will wrap up the debate for us. So, Taking it away, the topic is we have to face facts. No amount of today's conventional security will protect assets worth billions of dollars. Lead us off, Robert Clark. Donald Trump, J-Lo, Kim Kardashian. Billions of dollars of conventional security cannot protect those asses. I mean, these are some serious asses, and no amount of money can protect those particular... As a matter of fact, I heard J-Lo has insured her ass for like $1.2 million in and of herself. So I, I have to agree with my esteemed colleague's great quote saying that billions of dollars cannot secure these asses. That is so what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert Clark. Uh, Ed, I'm interested to see where you go with that. Over to you. All right. Uh, just look around you. There are many assets out there that are worth billions of dollars, and those are protected by today's conventional security because we advise it. The system actually works pretty well in the sense that it provides all of us with paychecks. If the proposition were wrong, if today's security could not protect today's assets, all of us here in this room would be frauds, which we're not, right? Uh, so uh, I want to put it to you very simply. If you vote for the affirmative, you're saying that you and your friends are all frauds. But hey, it's up to you. Vote your conscience. There you go. Thank you very much, Ed Felton. Dan Klein, how do you see this one? Mr. Spencer, you and I are reasonable people. I have some colleagues who are not quite so reasonable. It would be a shame if your daughter, hanging in the back of the room, were to suffer an accident where the rope that's holding her up by her thumbs might be cut. My colleagues like to be reasonable, but mm, they're hard to hold back sometimes, especially when it comes to billions of dollars. And I realize you don't have billions, but, you know, a couple of hundreds enough. <laughs> Let's be reasonable. <laughs> As has already been made clear, our panellists have special water. There's something obviously a little bit more special about the water down that end of the room. Peter Gutman, see some method in the madness, please. Over to you, sir. So look at this absolute statement. No amount of today's conventional security will stop things. It's nonsense, of course. Some amount of security will always stop anything. We know, for example, that we can scale fusion weapons up to an essentially any size we want. Take the Sloika configuration for a bomb. You take sodium-23 and lithium-6 deuteride, and you put it into a super tanker bomb. And that produces both a staggering amount of gamma radiation and a, about a 60 gigaton yield, which means if the radiation doesn't get you, then stripping the atmosphere off the planet and destroying all life on Earth will. So this immediately sets an upper bound on the amount of security that will stop just about anything. <laughs> Therefore, the other side is wrong, QED. <laughs> there you go. Over to you, Marco Ostini. You've got to uh, summarise in particular what Robert Clark and Dan Klein have already added to this debate for your side. 
So it's asses versus nukes. Wow, this is a beauty. Um, so I was going to talk about you know generations worth of half done jobs that we you know in information security have all inherited, but asses versus nukes definitely sounds a lot more interesting. Um, so unfortunately, even though this is all kind of humorous, at some point if we do want to uh, look after information security and make it last into the future. It has to be exactly the sort of thing that we do with uh, anything that matters to us. We take time. We think about it. We don't spend two seconds with our children. We take time with them. And so with information security, uh, to, to actually help it to be able to defend the assets, we have to take the time. We've got to ponder before we commit code. We have to think about it before we compile. And so um, let's all become, let's all practice meditation before we compile. That's my suggestion. You could meditate on asses or extremely large nuclear weapons if necessary. Thank you very much, Marco Asturney. Wrapping up there, a very... I don't want to influence the way you vote, but a very coherent and compelling case for the affirmative that's been presented by those three speakers. Whew. But it's going to be all made a lot clearer now by a guy who's refuting his own quote. Stephen Wilson, wrap this up for us. I mean, what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> And we had, Al we had Alex Tilley from Federal Police at the Gala dinner last night um, saying, saying words of wisdom, pearls of wisdom, that you should surround yourself with a team of people that make you look like an idiot or make you, make you look stupid. And I thought, I do that really well in a team of one, have done for, for a long, long time. <laughs> but look, um, you think that I'm in an awkward position. I'm in a, I'm in a sticky wicket for the American friends. Um, a conflict of interest? No, not at all. I've been misquoted. The original quote was about venture capitalists. And it was saying that no conventional security will ever protect assholes worth billions of dollars. <laughs> there you go. Well, over to you now, ladies and gentlemen. This should be a pretty clear one to decide. Whew, we have to face facts. No amount of today's conventional security will protect assets, asses, assholes, nukes worth billions of dollars. You've got 10 seconds to vote for the affirmative, who will Robert Clark, Dan Klein and Marco Ostini, or the negative, Ed Felton, Peter Goodman and Stephen Wilson, refuting his own quote there. You've got five more seconds. And I'll wrap it up. Now, with a convincing win to the nose, 61.5% to 38.5%, so congratulations, Peter Goodman, Stephen Wilson and Ed Felton. Give them a round of applause. That's our second last topic. For the day, securing trust is more important than trusting security is our final topic. Securing trust is more important than trusting security. The affirmative term will be Stephen Wilson, Scott McIntyre, Dan Klein. The negative term will be Robert Clark, Ed Felton. And Patrick, if it's all right with you, I'll include you on this debate. If that's all right, you'll be on the negative. You got that? You're on the negative in this debate, Patrick. Good, let's go. Take it away, Stephen Wilson. Well, this is a real change of pace, um, and, and I am in my comfort zone. I have spent 18 years railing against trust. Um, it is just such tosh. Um, it's, it's apple pie sort of nonsense, motherhood stuff. Trust this, and I am delighted, actually, that only, um, with the greatest respect, I think only two of the sponsors here um, at AllCert this year have got trust in their name. Um, I think 10 years ago, it was probably every other company was trusted um, and had to tell you how trusted they were, so we're glad that we've got past that. Um, look, folks, trust is for toilet paper commercials. Uh, and I guess we need to take a position here. It's a bit circular, um, trusting security, securing trust. But um, we will take a position, and we will say that certainly securing toilet paper is much more important than papering over security. Thank you very much, Stephen Wilson. Robert Clark, your chance to lead it off for the negative. So I'm with Patrick Gray on this one because I read the sentence and I'm not sure if I'm for the affirmative or the negative on this. But I will say this and go back to the currency aspect. My currency tells me, in God we trust. So if I don't have trust, then I've got to give up all my religion. And if I give up all my religion, then I'm going to be lost because every time I'm on the golf course, I'm like, Oh, please, Lord, let this be right. And every time I'm at a bar, I'm like, oh, please let me have five more dollars for another drink. So I do a lot of trust in God when I'm praying for these different things. So I need trust. Thank you very much, Robert Clark. 
You've been very revealing, Robert. I do like that. You've, you've really given us a win window into yourself today. It's been like an episode of Ricky Lake. I've been loving every second of it. <laughs> Scott McIntyre for the affirmative. Securing trust is more important than trusting security. My cocktail is empty. Just throwing that out there. Say, Bob, Bob, do you trust the NSA? <laughs> like, of course you would. So the answer here is, this is obviously a very obvious statement. Securing trust is fundamental. This is the foundation element that we need to once again start over and reaffirm that there's actually something worth trusting for the future. Because what's happened by the five eyes and the other Medusa stepchildren that have gone out there and destroyed all form of trust over the last year, or well, multiple years, we have an opportunity to treat this as a security tabula rasa. We have an opportunity to work with all of you with the community, with normal people, and say, look, this is what security means to you. For a very long time, I was the mechanic when it came to IT security. I would build my own kernels, I would tweak compilers, I would muck about with the carburetor and so on. Now, I, like most people, want to be able to get in the car and drive. We're at a point with computer security where we have a chance to make you, to make your friends and your family s trust in the security itself. Thank you very much, Scott McIntyre. Ed Felton, your thoughts on the subject. Respected sir, I am David Coney, the chairman of the Contract Award Committee in the Government of Nigeria. We need a trustworthy, trustworthy partner to assist us in the transfer of 11,500,000 United States dollars for investment in your country. Please note that this transaction is 100% safe and the funds will arrive in your account in 10 banking days from receipt of a suitable name and bank account into which the funds can be paid. We are looking forward to doing business with you and solicit your confidentiality in this transaction. Yours faithfully, David Coney. All right, now I read that because Mr. David Coney is a leading expert on securing trust. That's basically the business that he's in. That's not the business that we're in. Uh, we are about uh, security. Uh, and in any case, if you wonder whether you should vote for securing trust or trusting security, just remember those signs you saw when you came in the door every day at this conference. They said, trusting security. Thank you very much, Ed Felton, there for the negative. Give him a round of applause, yes. <laughs> final speech for the affirmative on the final topic of the day. And so it's your final chance to chat, Dan Klein. Is it, is it right, before we start your clock there, Dan, what they said in, in, in your intro, so you're a photographer, an improvised actor, and a singer, as well as security. That would unfortunately be true, yes. <laughs> what, so, what, sort of, what are your preferred singing styles? Mostly a cappella. Yeah. And if you want me to sing something, I'll do it from the chapel. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, throw you might, you, in, in this last speech on securing trust is more important than trusting security. I'd like a bit of improvised chapel singing, if that's all right. Okay. First of all, Claire, I'd like to thank you for the holy water. It has made this a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> in medieval times, we had faith. For those without faith, there was the stake upon which to burn. <laughs> Today we only have trust, and unlike faith, trust cannot be mandated, it must be earned. <laughs> By earning trust, obtaining trust, and securing trust, we convey faith. The stakes are high, but are no longer things on which to burn. Trust me, this is for the best. Join me now in singing all. Amen. <laughs> there you go, Dan Klein. Okay. Our final submission for the afternoon, and he, I can't wait because he's known, he's known he's been involved in this debate for at least five minutes now, so I can't wait to see what Patrick Ray's got to say. Far away, Patrick. It's hard to compete with that, <laughs> but I'll give it a shot. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Chewbacca. Chewbacca is a Wookiee from the planet Kishik, but he lives on Endor, surrounded by four-foot-tall Ewoks. Why would an eight-foot-tall Wookiee want to live on Endor surrounded by a bunch of four-foot Ewoks. It does not make sense. None of this makes sense. Why am I talking about Chewbacca? You might be asking yourself, why is he talking about Chewbacca? It does not make sense. Ladies and gentlemen, if it does not make sense, you must agree with the negative.
Thank you. <laughs> ah. The old Chewbacca defence. Nice work. OK, there we go. Our final topic for Auscert 2014 speed debating. Securing trust is more important than trusting security. The affirmative, Stephen, Scott and Dan. The negative, Robert, Ed and Patrick Ray. Is trust just for toilet paper companies? Did you like your speech delivered as a Gregorian chant? Or do you accept the Chewbacca defence? It is your choice. You've got all oh, the voting's very close. Get those votes in there if you're wavering. Make them count now. This is absolutely line ball in our final debate. I'll give you 10 more seconds. We're talking literally, I won't say which side, but 51 to 49% at the moment. So send them through. Send them through. It's too close to call. Five, four, three, for two, me. one. <laughs> Lock it in now. Oh, the yes is 51.8, 50.9%, 49.1% so the narrowest of margins. Congratulations, Dan Klein, Scott McIntyre, and Stephen Wilson have won that final debate. Give them a round of applause. And so I've gone back and tabulated across all the topics um, how people have performed, and uh, there were um, uh, nine people involved in the debate today. We had uh, a couple of people registering one out of four, good luck to them, a slew of people on two out of four, and two people who were successful in three of their four topics. So congratulations, our equal winners today, Scott McIntyre, and you were on three out of three until you tried the Chewbacca defence. Patrick Gray, give Patrick and Scott a round of applause, but also please, Peter Goodman, Dan Klein, Stephen Wilson, Robert Clark, Marcus Sachs, Marco Astini, and Ed Felton. Thank you so much, guys, that was fantastic. If you want to get up and leave the stage, Claire has a thank you gift for your efforts waiting for you down there. So please, one more round of applause for our panel as they leave the stage, that was great.